This sonic drive-in on Shady Grove Lane is owned by the Dick Lear family. It's part of the largest sonic co-op in the country. We'll hear how a farm boy from Kansas came to Irving and created both an empire and a legacy in this edition of Profiles. As I looked at all of the information that I have about you from the various sources that I have them from, it strikes me that you've got the all-American success story. And you know, it's the whole thing. Boy meets girl, marries his childhood sweetheart, uh, uh, has a great dream, gets it shattered, comes up with a new dream, builds success. But there's a whole lot of road from A to Z there, isn't there? That's right. <laughs> you were born in Anthony, Kansas. And you weren't the product of a rich family. True. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about growing up in Anthony. Well, we uh, uh, didn't live in Anthony. We were we lived about three miles out of Anthony, and uh, my dad was a farmer, wheat farmer. And I guess by the time I was probably uh, oh, I was in the second grade, and we moved across the line into Oklahoma, which is only about. 10, 11 mile, and I went to school at Manchester, Oklahoma. Uh, we moved down there on a farm, and uh, we lived there till my sophomore year in high school. Did you and have the farm chores? And I mean, am I talking classic oh, farm life here? Yes, yeah. Cows, yeah. Not many, not many. It's basically farming. Mm -hmm. But uh, and again, we lived three miles out of Manchester. And uh, that's that's where we went to school, rode a bus, and uh, uh, went there. Like I say, till Dad went broke farming, and then went uh, to work in Boeing in Wichita, Kansas. But uh, about all we done it was a very small school. Uh, but I uh, made a lot of good friends down there, and. Uh, uh, one of them was my wife. <laughs> she, yeah, you met her at a very early age. Yeah, we went to school. I think she started. She came there from a Catholic school in about the uh, sixth or seventh grade. And by the time we was 13, we was going together. <laughs> 13? Uh, yeah, 13, 14. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. you meet her when she's 13, and of course at 13, you know, it's puppy love, but that puppy love has yielded you how many years of a happy marriage? Uh, 48. 48 this hours. last, uh, so December 31st of 2002. Wow. Yeah. That, yeah, that's fabulous. <laughs> that is right. fabulous. It really that's is. That's great. Yeah, I can tell. Look you at your face. I mean, <laughs> you can tell it's made you happy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and you loved baseball, too. Yeah, I played baseball and uh, uh, started, you know, young when uh, <clears throat> this school in Manchester, uh, there was only like uh, 36 or 38 in the whole high school. Oh my goodness. Uh, I think there was eight in my class and seven in Jolene's class. And uh, so the only thing you could play was uh, softball. We didn't have baseball there, but we played softball and basketball. Then, you know, it didn't take that many kids yeah. for those sports. And uh, uh, Jolene also played basketball. But uh, I was left-handed, and I could throw hard. And and my dad played baseball, and my dad played a lot of catch with me. And uh, so, I don't know, I played first base, and then I started pitching. And... Dad nailed up, uh, I mean, it's like the stories you've heard uh, out against the chicken house. He put a bushel basket out there, and I had about three baseballs, and I'd either knock the boards off the chicken house or where the baseball's at, <laughs> you know, trying to hit that bushel basket. Oh, and, yeah. That's and great. Then we just, uh, you know, I got, I started playing Anthony. Which was like I said, eleven mile away. They had a uh, American Legion team, and I went. I played on that American Legion team, and 
when I was 16 years old at Pratt, Kansas. There was a league that a lot of ball players played in. Uh, it was called the Ben Johnson League in Kansas. There's an East and West Division, and uh, a guy that probably a lot of people's heard about played in the Eastern Division. He was ahead of me, but uh, Mickey Mantle. I've heard and, of him. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. There were a lot of major leaguers played in that. They went on because college people, they were 18 to 21 year old league. And uh, uh, I started playing that league when I was 17 or 16. That's incredible. 16. So you, when you say you had a strong arm and you could throw <clears throat> hard, that really must have been the case. Now, for those sports challenged out there, mm -hmm. like myself, being a left-handed pitcher is kind of a special thing in baseball. Yes, it was. It, and it, it is today. Yeah. Why is but, that? <clears throat> I guess just the way the ball comes in on the hitters, it's just, it's just backwards to most. Of it. But, but that's the reason why there's getting to be more and more switch hitters. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, there's, a, there's a reason for it. But I don't know a left-hander that could throw hard that can throw a actual straight fastball. I never could. It'll always tail off for... It, it, the lock goes straight. <laughs> well, I tell you, <clears throat> you must have been doing something right because you ended up, if I recall correctly, actually getting the very first baseball scholarship to the college that you went to? Yes, ma'am. Wow. It, it was called <laughs> Wichita University then. It's Wichita State now. Mm -hmm. That was in uh, 1953. Wow. So and did you get scouted in the whole thing? Oh, I was going, uh, yeah, I got scouted by the Yankees. Uh, Phillies, Cubs, Reds, a lot of scouts. And you all set to play baseball. Yeah, and I was uh, I was going to Kansas City to throw batting practice to the New York Yankees in a spring training deal, and that's when I hurt my arm two weeks ahead of that. And uh, the guy that signed uh, Mickey Mantle was uh, the guy Tom Greenway was his name. How'd you uh, put your arm? Throwing. Oh. I could throw. Uh, you know, I didn't have the coaching then that, uh, that these people have now and, uh, and the medical techniques and uh, I tore uh, the uh, right here this muscle right here in my forearm and it never did heal back scar tissue I, I threw after that but it'd be another six weeks before I could throw again you know it just so my career was over that was and, your uh, that was your shot and there was no yeah. way you could do it no mm. and uh, that's right and that was my life dream at that time. Well, and what's more American than being able to play baseball for, for uh, the Yankees? That's I mean, exactly truly. right. That's right. Yeah. <sighs> but you didn't lay down and roll over. You got up, which right. I guess that's what you have to do, that's don't right. you? Well, uh, we were married. Jolene and I were married then. Uh, and uh, I was working at Boeing Aircraft in Wichita, making, I think I was making $120 every two weeks. Ooh. <laughs> and I, but I was just working 40 hours. I, I finally got on at Rainbow Bread when I was 19. And I started working about 70 hours a week, but I was making $65 a week. I was, I was making another $5. So that's $10 every two weeks or $20 a month. <laughs> we needed that. <laughs> and... Uh, and that, then I got a bread route when I was 19, and uh, uh, pretty aggressive guy on a bread route, and uh, took a route from the bottom, to, I think it was 17 or 18 bread routes, and uh, a year and a half, I was in a number two spot in the bakery, <laughs> and just been working, you know, and uh, meeting people, you know, just I had a person, I'll never forget, his name was Pat Hammond. He was president of the bakery there. He told me, he said, Dick, he said, Rainbow Bread is sold in Wichita, Kansas. All you got to do is sell yourself. And uh, I'll never forget that. That's great advice. That is great advice. That's great advice. That's now, right. <clears throat> one of the things that I love that, that you say that's so quotable, I and mean, I have it written on my computer now, is you'll either work real hard when you're young or you'll work real hard when you're old. That's a true story. 
That is a true story. Where, where did that come from for you? You just made up your mind. I, I know you said you're goal-driven. That's yeah, yeah kind of yeah. the obvious thing. Where did that come um, from for you? Oh, uh, I'm pretty sure somebody's, uh, I think it was a guy by the name of Harry Hoops. He was my sales manager in Wichita. I've heard Harry say that before. Yeah, yeah. Well, I tell you, you work what. Hard when you're young, you work hard when you're old. That's right. <laughs> so you decided you were going to do that while you were young. True story. Yeah. True story. That's right. Sacrificed a lot. Uh, Jodine, Jolene done a beautiful job raising our first three children because <laughs> I wasn't around that much. I was working. You had a lot to do. You had uh -huh. uh, uh, some real big plans once you started working for Rainbow. Would you yeah. would you share those? Well, uh, like I said, I went on that bread route when I was 19, and uh, we, in 1964, down here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, the same company that owns Rainbow, which it was at that time was a company called Camel Taggart, and they, owned, they had two bakeries, one here and one in Kansas City called Manor Bakers. And uh, they were retail routes, went door to door. And in 1964, they decided that uh, they were going to go wholesale, start calling on grocery stores. And uh, Fort Worth was a depot out of Dallas. The baker was in Dallas, and we had a depot in Fort Worth. And I get sent down there on that changeover. Well, we were the leading bread company in Wichita, and uh, I'd never heard of Miss Baird's. And uh, <laughs> and uh, I made the comment down there that, uh, boy, this would be a good opportunity for somebody. And uh, two weeks later, I'm a Texan. <laughs> <laughs> and that somebody was you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And uh, there, was, uh, <clears throat> there was four supervisors brought in there. We were from all over the country. And, uh, but I brought... Uh, uh, I moved my family, Jolene, and three children, Pam, Kevin, and Pat, and I think they were four, six, and eight. And we made that transfer. We'd never been that far from home in our life. Thought we'd driven across the world by the time we got down here. And uh, uh, it was a big, big change in our life. I mean, we were homesick. Uh, First time didn't, away from family. didn't know anybody, and I'm working 16, 18 hours, seven days a week. I'd go three, I can remember one time I'll ever get, I went three straight weeks, seven days a week. I never saw my children awake. Wow. And in the same house. They were asleep when I left, and they were asleep when I got home. Well, that but, sacrifice yeah. in terms of, of the kinds of hours that you were putting in and the kinds of things that you were doing to build your part of, of the business yielded some results for you in terms of how quickly you moved. Mm -hmm. Because at 25, if I'm recalling correctly, you'd already made quite a name for yourself around the region. Well, uh, yeah, I was a supervisor at 23. And uh, then we, uh, uh, I was transferred down here. I'd been supervisor up there. I think we were 28 when, when we became Texans. And uh, golly, it don't seem that long ago, but it's been quite a while now. <laughs> <I like you. laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, Jolene has been my right arm. You know, whether it, uh, in the bread business, you know, she raised children. But she did know. All she had to do is tell the kids, uh, I'll tell your dad. <laughs> <laughs> she had my support. <laughs> That's wonderful. But, uh, uh, you know, then uh, in, in the bread business, we got transferred to uh, the Dallas Bakery in 1966. And that's when we moved to Irving. And uh, we've been in Irving since 1966. Well, I have to say, because I know the kinds of things you've done since you've been here, that that was absolutely Irving's game. To have your family here. Well, that's nice for you to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Let me let me just make make this comment because here you are now with a brand new dream. 
you're really making progress in the bread business and it, you shared with me that because you were a goal-oriented person your next goal was a big one mm -hmm. what was that well uh, Camel Taggart Camel helped me make that dream uh, change because uh, they had they got a new CEO and uh, I was sales manager and I just had one step kind of between me and running a bakery and that was my goal the time I was 40. Well, uh, like I told you, I, I had left college uh, early and they came with a new program. You had to have a college degree to run a bakery and uh, I didn't have that. I was just 38 and there'd been a lot of guys in the Wichita, Kansas bakery that had quit and got in the Sonic driving business. And I told Jolene, I said, you know, I said, uh, I could sell more bread than they could. I can sell more hamburgers if I can, <laughs> if I can just get that opportunity. Yeah. And a person that had helped some of those guys get started, landlorded their deals and everything, uh, co-signed for Jolene and I to get started in 1974. And uh, we, uh, we only like nine months to be investors for retirement with Rainbow Bread in, uh, in uh, 1974. Nine but, months. Yeah, but I knew, I always knew that if I had an opportunity to work as hard for myself as I had them, we could make it. You had a few uh, things in front of you. You had a daughter in college mm -hmm. when you decided to go with Sonic, and you had a little surprise. Yeah, we did. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's about two weeks after I had left the bakery that uh, I'm down in Longview, Texas, training with my cousin Bill at a Sonic drive-in, and uh, and uh, I can't remember if I came home that weekend or if uh, I got a phone call. But uh, Jolene said uh, we're expecting the baby, <laughs> and that was uh, I guess Jason is 14 and a half years younger than Pat, and it was. Uh, that wasn't in the program <laughs> when I left the bakery. How but, tough is this? One in college, a brand new business, and one on the way. <laughs> that's right. It's, it, it, it's a stretch. <laughs> but uh, when I was training down in, uh, in Longview, I was only making, I think, $150 a week training. And that was uh, in 1974. That's right. And Jolene was, uh, she was working for a company over in Dallas called American Cyanamid. She was working. And, and taking, try, she'd take three kids to school, and uh, that's a bet. strong right arm. That's right, <laughs> well, you bet. Yeah. And, and so uh, that was, uh, uh, but that was the start of our dream. And uh, we opened our first store here in Irving in 1974, May the first, and uh, we we just. Just went from there. Yeah. Now, I think I remember <coughs> you telling me that that particular store in the entire chain was number 201? Uh-huh. Right. It, there was, that was the 201st Sonic drive-in in the United States then in 1974. I mean, that, it was only about, uh, let's see, there was Mesquite and about the third one in the Dallas proper. There was stores, and there was a store in Waxahachie and Terrell and out outer line areas like that, but they had always been a little bit afraid of coming into the big cities, you know, afraid of competition, but and we broke that ice. And, I uh, would say you have. What's uh, the picture today? Well, uh, in our chain now, uh, uh, we will be 50 years old as a chain this year, and uh, we're having our cel celebration in Hawaii. But, uh, that's not bad. <laughs> that's right. But uh, now we do have now uh, close to 220 stores in our uh, uh, co-op. And that's just that, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that's, alone. That's right, yeah. And uh, we have, uh, uh, we started the co-op, I don't know, a long time ago with kind of nothing. And uh, I was president of the co-op. For Talk about why you started the co-op, because it was not a usual thing, well, was it? There, was, uh, <clears throat> there wasn't that many stores. There was probably 20, 25 stores around then, 
and more franchisees than there should have been. And everybody was doing their own little thing and we were spending a lot of money on, you know, and not getting any results. Mm -hmm. And I kept telling them, you know, if we will pool our money, we can get a lot more for less. And uh, we ended up developing this co-op. And, uh, and before that, well, I just got the idea that, you know, we're going to market and these other franchisees called it giving food away, but uh, we started doing a lot of buy one, get one freeze. You know, my deal is that you've always, you have to make things happen, you can't wait. And uh, so we, you know, we was always giving out buy one, get one freeze, you know. And because we know if we can get them to buy that hamburger, we could sell them french fries and, and drinks, you know. And that that was our marketing. And then we, we get doing this as as a group, you know, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And now, uh, uh, I was president for uh, 18 years, and I guess it's been about three or four years ago I retired, and they treated Jolene and I like a king and a queen at our convention when we did. We come off the advisory board. We was on the advisory board in Oklahoma City. So that's what that was for. But uh, there's been, uh, since I was president, there's, uh, there was, uh, I think, two people followed me on terms, but uh, now my son Patrick has, is in his second term as president of the co-op. Yeah, so. I don't know that you will say this because I've found you to be pretty modest, so I'm going to say it for you. There's a lot of people probably wouldn't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just my experience okay. so far. Okay. What you did with, with forming that co-op and your ideas about marketing grew the chain because you're a visionary. You had big ideas and then you took all the practical steps to make those things happen. And I can see that from the outside. Did you see that from the inside or were you just working as hard as you could? Well, uh, I can see where I had a vision, uh, but I might have not realized what that vision how big it could get. Never did I ever think that I'd see our chain as successful as it is today. And uh, the Lears get a lot of credit in the Dallas-Fort Worth Co-op from, from people outside this area about what we went through to get where we are in the co-op. We have the biggest co-op in the chain down here and been basically by far the most successful co-op in the chain. And there's been a lot of lessons taken from what we did. Uh, uh, I used to be pretty aggressive, you know. I, uh, uh, I can't or no has never been in my vocabulary, you know. Uh, you gotta make it work. You figure out why to work rather than why it won't. And, so. <laughs> and then you go with the things that work. That's right. And you, you lead and you don't drive, but sometimes you have to uh, a little bit of tough love to get where you want to get to. Well, that's one of the things that I love about knowing uh, the way you've handled, especially your employees, because we're talking Sonic, uh, beneath your managerial staff, you've got a bunch of kids. Mm -hmm. And you, the, the things that you've instituted for those kids in terms of, uh, I love the, the, how did you put it, everything's a positive. All right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Tell yeah. me about that whole well, concept. <clears throat> when I was running the store, we, you know, we uh, Kids come in, though, when I have to work again, you don't, you know. Well, why? I said, you get to work again, you know. <laughs> and it was a deal. You don't have to sleep the lot. You get to. And if you don't do a good job, you get to do it again. And <laughs> trash cans are the same way, you know. It's, it was just, we we uh, uh, we shared a, a lot of positive things to, uh, to kids. And... Uh, and students, and we we like to hire kids that uh, that are active in their schools, and they they just bring good things to the Sonic Drive-In. And and uh, over our 28 and a half years, we've worked with a lot of kids, and uh, a lot of kids, a lot of friends. Start. 
A lot of friends, right. Uh, that, that concept of friendship, too, certainly has worked for you, has worked to your benefit. And, and I know that you were very surprised to receive Sonic's top honor, the Troy Smith Award. Yeah, uh, let's see. I believe that was in 19... Nineteen. <laughs> you want to say ninety-five? <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. I believe it was uh, ninety-five. I believe it was ninety-five. We're at the. Uh, uh, well, let me tell you what the Troy Smith Award is. Please. Uh, I think I was the eighth one to get it, but uh, they had started this in our company. Uh, Troy Smith is uh, uh, the founder of our company. And uh, they started this Troy Smith Award. Well, uh, there have been some old pioneers get that award. I mean, it had been around, but was there. I mean, I think the company was 22 years old when I uh, went into business. So there's been a lot of guys around a lot longer than me. And uh, uh, we were in Las Vegas at our convention. And Jolene and I were sitting at a table in the back with some friends. You know, we'd had our meal and we'd give away. And the last thing is the Troy Smith Award. Well, I'm sitting there with my tie undone and uh, my coat off. You know, it was kind of warm in there. And I tell Jolene, I says, golly, I'm ready to go out and have some fun. I said, I'd be glad this is over, you know. And I was talking to somebody else. And, uh, I believe it was Cliff Hudson uh, talking about this person, you know. And I wasn't listening. Jolene said, honey, you better get your tie on. Honey, you better get your coat on. <laughs> and uh, that's what we had absolutely no idea. That. Wow. And we, uh, we received the Troy Smith Award. And that is the most elite and the most proud award that you can get in the Sonic Driving business, and uh, it was great. Yeah, I can it, imagine. It was great. When, when you look at what you've been able to accomplish with, you've surrounded yourself with great people, mm -hmm. um, starting with Jolene, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you've been able to grow from uh, uh, one drive-in that you owned 40% of in the early days to just a, a major chain, you really right. have. What do you think have been the most important ingredients to your success? Oh, uh, treating people like I would like to be treated and uh, developing uh, their loyalty with you. And, and uh, the way you get that is uh, through love and discipline. And, uh, knowing that you care about them and being a good listener. Uh, you know, what may not be very important to uh, to a person, if they're having a problem or something, it's the biggest, it's the most important thing that person has to talk about. And uh, I've always tried to listen, you know, and uh, Maybe even guide, you know. And, and that that that's where you develop your loyalty. Those people have to know. Uh, I mean, I think people know whether you're putting on a front or whether you're not. Uh, they can see through you. I I can see through people pretty easy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it's been said that from 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 one of your employees who thinks the world of you that your leadership comes from understanding people, great great people skills, this, this person said, and the ability to always let people know where they stand with you. That what you see, when you see Dick Lear, you see the whole package, and you're not going to get any fluff. You're going to get exactly what you think. Okay. How important has that been to your success? Very, very, very. Uh, <clears throat> but sometimes, uh, I've been told by my leader that, you know, you're a little straightforward, you know. Well, and, and I've, try, I've tried to work on that, but uh, I, I think, and, and my biggest 
best teacher to that was the person I mentioned when I was in bread business, Harry Hoops. I mean, uh, I can remember one time Harry Hoops made me cry when I was 21 years old. But when we walked out of his arm, uh, out of his office, he had his arm around me, and he was God to me, you know. And uh, I, I never hold grudges, you know. People know every day how they stand with Dick Bear. And, and they like it. They know I have two sides, and they try to stay away from that other side. <laughs> <laughs>